We are talking mindfulness and happiness today with Greg Hammer, MD. He's a recently retired professor at Stanford University School of Medicine, a pediatric intensive care physician, pediatric anesthesiologist, and also a wellness and mindfulness lecturer. He's the author of Gain Without Pain, the Happiness Handbook for Healthcare Professionals. And that definitely applies to everybody else and not just healthcare professionals. Um, we are going into what GAIN is. It's an acronym um, and is kind of the four big hitters that he hits on that lead to personal happiness. We got into a pretty philosophical, um, how should I put it? Yeah, it was a deep, it was a deep one today. A very philosophical co conversation and we are just so aligned. <laughs> in terms of what we have experienced in our own lives and what we now teach about that really leads to a place of internal peace and less suffering, uh, less unnecessary suffering. Um, so we'll go ahead and dive into it. Here is Dr. Greg Hammer. Okay, so Dr. Hammer, I'm excited to talk to you today about gain without pain. And I you know, wanted to just dive right into it. Can you Tell us what you mean. What what is gain without pain? Uh, that the happiness handbook for healthcare professionals is your book. But what do you mean by gain? Gain is an acronym, Tara, for what I think are really the fundamentals of mental and spiritual well being, and they are gratitude. That's the G in gain. Acceptance, intention, and non judgment. And as we were acknowledging prior to the recording. The fundamentals of physical well-being are sleep, exercise, and nutrition. And I think that gratitude, acceptance, intention, and non-judgment are the fundamentals of mental and spiritual well-being. And they are extremely interrelated. So not only are sleep, exercise, and nutrition very integrated and interrelated, but so are gratitude, acceptance, intention, and non-judgment. And then, of course, those elements for physical and spiritual well-being are very much interrelated. So mm -hmm. it all goes together. It's kind of hard to talk about one mm -hmm. element without the others. But in particular, right. when we talk about uh, the gain elements, domains, and the gain practice, those four domains are are really inseparable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mentioned to you before we started, and I'll just let the audience in on like how aligned we are on this. Um, because yes, in my coaching, we do training and nutrition and some deeper lab, you know, all that health stuff. But for the life coaching end of things, I'm really big on circadian rhythm. Like I, I see circadian rhythm, not really, yeah, it's a health thing, but I see it mostly significantly as a mindset meets internal happiness meets, uh, you know, being able to be at peace throughout the day, be operating at full tilt, be able to change, have the bandwidth to be able to be kind to yourself and take a look at your life and not feel overwhelmed and burnout and not have all these mood dysregulations from your hunger hormones being thrown off and your, you know, your body's trying to guess what's going on every day. I see honestly sleep hygiene as more of in the mindset part of the coaching that I do than I do the health part. And um, it's been significant for me. I I didn't get the that on lock until like the beginning of 2022. So it's only been like two and a half years for me of this, but I've been shouting from the rooftops. I'm like, man, I was already healthy. I was already fit. I already, ha you know, was good with eating. Like I was already a meditator. I was already in you know, all those things. Well, I, I'm like, are you guys hearing me? I'm, t I'm telling you everything in my life went from like, chaos and hard to like this, like extreme sense of ease. Like it was so profound for me. It was almost as profound as when I went from standard American diet to getting healthy. It was about like that level of like, wow, life can be like this from going to bed about the same time and getting up at the same time. Or I was just like, wow, everything's so much easier now. Everything's so much easier. I'm so much happier. So I love that you hit on this specific thing on top of just, it's not just like exercise and eating well. If your sleep is all over the place and you're not having some of these mindfulness practices, I, I did that. I looked really fit on the outside. I was not doing well on the inside. And sometimes I don't think you realize that like, you don't realize you can feel better until you do. Right. So, okay. I want to take a second to really go into each of these. I know you're like, it's kind of hard to talk about anything in a vacuum because that's not reality, but 
you know, gratitude, it is a practice for me. I did it this morning. You know, it's very rare that I miss my kind of my anchor moment in the morning because I love it so much and I've seen what it brings to me in my life. So, you know, on this, the, the gratitude, you know, why did you bring this into your, you know, you're only hitting on four things here. Why was gratitude one of them? Gratitude is so intrinsic to happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we all can appreciate that one can be poor and happy. One can be physically challenged and happy. Yeah. But you can't even imagine somebody who's ungrateful and happy. Yeah. And gratitude is really part of, I would say, at least those that are familiar to me, all spiritual and philosophical traditions. Mm -hmm. Gratitude is embedded as a mainstay. And mm -hmm. so I think there's just no getting around it. It's essential to that one thing that all nearly 8 billion of us want, which is happiness. Yeah. And yeah. that's what the book is about. And I think that's what you and I are both all about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I sometimes have, have I, like, you could try it right now if you're listening, like feel grateful for something and like try to, at the same time to feel like any sort of negative emotion. It's, it's impossible. You know, I've tried even feeling gratitude for my muscles as I'm doing a really heavy squat. And it's, it's like, wow, like you're literally happy instead of, uh, you know, like fearful or scared or like, oh my gosh, like, uh, you know, it's like, wow, good job. Quads are so, wow. I'm so grateful. I can do this. It just takes you over the top. So I, I, it's, it's true, you know, and, um, for me, I do a written gratitude practice and I write how I feel when I think about those things ex besides grateful. And that's just a practice for me and, and my clients now too, to tap in, to become more emotionally aware of, you know, what am I feeling besides grateful? What other things are coming in here? Even if sometimes those are like, I'm grateful for that. And I feel scared. I'm grateful for that. And I feel pressured about it. <laughs> just noticing, you know, um, uh, well, what that's why the, like that? the the second domain of gain is acceptance, because, mm -hmm. you know, it's great to have gratitude. It's essential, but it's not sufficient. Yeah. I think we need the other three elements as well. But I think that, um, you know, our brains are wired in ways that evolved for our survival to increase our chances of surviving. And in some cases, those are at odds with our ability and desire for happiness, ability yeah. to be happy. And one example is that we have a negativity bias. We tend to remember the negative and embrace it and forget about the positive. Mm -hmm. And that's very much related to gratitude. Gratitude is the cure for our negativity bias, along with yeah. acceptance, intention, non-judgment. And an example is you know, many, many of us begin to have negative thoughts even before we get out of bed. So we're practicing good sleep hygiene. We slept well. We get up at our appointed time. But even before we get out of bed, there's a natural tendency, according to the way our brains are, are wired, to think of something negative. So my knee is a little bit sore. So I'm turning over. I noticed that I'm having a little bit of pain in my knee. Maybe I overdid it with the squats yesterday. <laughs> what have you. So I focus on that. I focus on the uh, discomfort I might feel as I'm getting out of bed and walking to the commode. Instead, we can easily retrain ourselves, or maybe not easily, but, but mm -hmm. uh, most definitely retrain ourselves to think positive through gratitude. So imagine yeah. instead of focusing on that one negative thing about our physiology, Right. We instead focus on something positive for which we're grateful. What a miracle mm -hmm. that our kidneys were working all night, that our kidneys are filtering our blood, removing all these toxins from our blood, sending them in this fluid down to our bladder where it's conveniently stored so we don't have to get up every 15 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, stored overnight. And then we get up in the morning and we can just get rid of that. What a beautiful mm -hmm. physiologic system that was mm -hmm. working for most of us perfectly while we were sleeping. I'm so grateful for that. It's just remarkable. It blows me away when I think about mm -hmm. the, the myriad aspects of our physiology that normally are working well, but because of our negativity bias, we, we often ignore those and we focus instead on that one right. negative thing. Right. And so 
again, gratitude is essential to helping us rewire the brain and transcend this negativity bias that we have. But mm -hmm. again, uh, I think that we're well served by incorporating the other domains of gain as well. Yeah. And on this gratitude note, like it, it's such an important one in relationships, right? Because of this negativity bias, it's so easy to just hone in on the negatives and on our relationships. And when you, we use our own intention by choice to make it a way of being to start to have gratitude, express gratitude, feel gratitude for things that we may have missed before, which is in my opinion, the whole point of the, the practice Think about how much that impacts our relationships. So instead of just nitpicking on all the little things that are going wrong with, the, and that's always going to be with those closest to us. So our most important relationships are going to be the ones where that negative bias is going to come up most frequently. And I think this is like, I mean, at least I've noticed that for me, like it has really impacted uh, being able to access that feeling of gratitude more frequently in my all every relationship that I have in my life, you know, like, wow, I really appreciate that about you. Thank you so much. Like, oh, like, that's really sweet how you were about that. Thank you. You know, and so seeing as how uh, from that Harvard study, the that the quality of our relationships was the highest indicator of longevity and happiness. I think that it's probably, you know, a pretty important thing to practice within ourselves because, you know, have you noticed that also that it becomes a way of being in terms of relationships when you're more relationship? Absolutely. I think, though, it, you know, it starts with ourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and you can actually incorporate this into work on relationships. You can look in the mirror and say, could I have a successful relationship with someone just like me or are the faults? that I embody going to be the foci for my attention in a relationship with another human being. Mm. So that goes to acceptance, but yes, mm. absolutely. Uh, you know, we have to be uh, grateful for all of the gifts in life. And that includes the loving kindness that we can share with other people. And we need to have a plan. That's the I in gain is intention. So we need to have an intention to do on purpose this rewiring of our brain um, mm -hmm. toward gratitude, mm -hmm. toward accepting things that are uncomfortable or painful that we cannot change. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be able to do it on purpose. I love Dr. John Kabat-Zinn's definition of mindfulness, simply awareness of the present moment on purpose, non-judgmentally. Why on purpose? Because being aware of the present moment is not our nature. We talked about yeah. The fact that our brain is wired to be negative, it's also wired to be distracted. If you close your eyes, if one closes their eyes and simply tries to focus on our current sensation, the pressure of the chair against our body, mm -hmm. the tingling of the soles of our feet, our mind will quickly wander to the past or the future. And when you combine that with our negativity bias, we, we overthink the past we generate a lot of regret and shame and low self-esteem and imposter mm -hmm. syndrome, or our mind goes to the future and we obsess on the future with our negativity bias that generates a lot of fear and anxiety. Mm. So this negativity bias and ability to be present yeah. require the I and gain intention, purposefulness, a plan, a practice. And mm -hmm. the good news is it's very accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, curious your path on, on this. How did you come into, you know, was, did you start with a meditation practice and kind of got you into this world? Yeah. You know, I was kind of a hippie, um, started meditating and becoming a vegetarian and experimenting with psychedelics back in my university days. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I was always very interested in science Mm -hmm. and um, my undergraduate degrees in nutritional science, but I was also just very interested, uh, as you could tell from my analogy with the kidney physiology, I just yeah. always thought the way the human body worked was yeah. a miracle. And yeah. I was captivated from a young age and how the body works. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of encouraged me to go to medical school. And, um, and then I got really interested in critical care medicine and cardiac anesthesiology for children 
And I realized I'd be taking care of a lot of, a lot of very sick and, and dying patients and that many of my patients would die. Mm. And so I needed to take that head on. I didn't mm. want to have to keep a distance from my patients. I wanted to be present and close with them. So mm. I thought a lot about our mortality mm -hmm. and a lot about sort of the big questions in a, a very practical way. And mm. so that just sort of led me further and further down this path of of well-being mm -hmm. and how is it that we can become happy even in the context of a great deal of suffering yeah yeah i'm sure you've geeked out on you know victor frankl's book is like one of the most iconic you know man search for meaning on that you know and then uh, the happiness advantage on acor you know you're reminding me of this pursuit of like what is it that we all want? So that's that's a, a a question I've you know really sat with of like what is it that all my clients want? What is this? I'm like oh happiness. They perceive that if they do this thing, they will be more happy. That's what they're all chasing. All of us are chasing. We do, all the actions we're taking, all the you know things we get bent out of shape about is because we perceive that that's going to take away from our happiness. The fear and anxiety we get trapped in. Why? Because we want to be happy. You know. Even even when people want to control others, as we saw during the COVID thing, like it was like I from both sides, like, you know, even though there's these polarized extremes, I'm like, what do they want? They, they believe that their way is going to lead to people being safe and happy, both sides, you know? So it's like, we all want the same thing. The, the mask, you know, shot proponents are like, everybody needs to do this. Why? Because they want everybody safe and happy. The people who are like, no, we can't give away our freedom and you can't let people do this to us. Why? Because they want to make sure everybody's safe and happy. So different methodologies, everybody's chasing the same thing. And to me, I agree, like totally agree with you. It all boils down to that's what we're all looking for is we just want to be happy. <laughs> so I love that you took this on. And as a fellow psychonaut, I'm like, I'm so glad for, that you had those experiences when you're going to be having to be a um, experiencing pediatric deaths, which would be a lot for most people. But, you know, with psychedelics, your relationship with death kind of changes. You know, I, um, I, 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 I may still, yeah, let's see. I, I have a fear, I guess, that dying will hurt really bad. But in terms of like actually dying, I'm kind of curious what happens next. You know, like I'm <laughs> not really like, just like scared of that side of things. I'll miss yeah, my Unfortunately, kids, those that, friends, that have experienced but... it are unable to describe it for us. <laughs> right yeah there's a lot of unknown but i'm i'm a curious mind i'm kind of like well let's see i i know i know from my personal experiences i definitely believe that this is not it so this is not the only thing that exists you know and so i'm glad that you had those experiences and that kind of segues us into hitting a little deeper onto acceptance right so um yeah tell me more about this so acceptance you know why did what do you mean well, again, uh, acceptance is uh, a key element in in most, if not all, positive religious and philosophic traditions. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The Serenity Prayer. You know, we we ask for the ability to discern between what we can change and what we cannot change. Yeah, and the ability to cope with things we cannot change to accept them. And that is of huge importance. And again, these elements are all highly interwoven. Um, there's a formula in my first book, Gain Without Pain, suffering equals pain times resistance. We love yeah. formulas in medicine, of course. Yeah. So the pain is going to be there. Um, I yeah. lost my son eight years ago. That pain isn't going away. But if I resist mm -hmm. it, if I try always not to think about it, if I never come to terms with it, if I uh, resist it in so many other ways as we can resist discomfort with other people in relationships by depersonalizing them, that's a form of resistance. The more we resist this pain, the more we suffer. So I kind of picture Jesus on the cross with stakes through his hands and feet. And of course there was tremendous pain but I like to think that he had fully accepted his circumstances and therefore had transcended suffering. So the pain is there. It's how we respond to it that will determine the degree to which we suffer. So if we can accept uh, those elements by virtue of which 
the world apparently doesn't comport with our wants and needs mm -hmm. that cause suffering, cause pain rather, um, discomfort. If we can really accept those things, then our suffering will diminish. And I think this is key. So I think it's important and necessary to be grateful. It's important and necessary to be intentional mm -hmm. and non-judgmental. Those are key. But we also have to face things that are painful and sit with them and really refine our skills to accept those things if we can't change them. And that's key to happiness as much as gratitude, intention, and non-judgment mm -hmm. are. Thank you for sharing uh, that about losing your son. Um, and I, I was curious to ask, cause you know, for people I know who have, um, someone very close to me lost his son as a, you know, a young teenager in a very traumatic way, his only child. Um, uh, I've had other friends who've lost children or, you know, just there's people who, you know, the, their whole family died in a car accident, except them, you know, like these like horrific blind sighting traumas like that. Um, do you, do you have any coming from that, from your own experience, do you have any wisdom or insights to share on like what the journey to acceptance was like for you? Because I find that one, like when there's big traumas like that, um, it's very hard to get to a place of acceptance, you know? Mm -hmm. So just wondering if you have any, anything to share deeper on that. Sure. As I said, I started really doing this work when I decided to go into cardiac anesthesiology and intensive care medicine, because I knew I would be faced with mm -hmm. a lot of pain and suffering mm -hmm. patients and their families. So I decided early on that I needed to figure out a way to, to deal with this. And mm -hmm. Uh, for me, it's really uh, just sort of the, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of an inward facing path person. I sort mm -hmm. of let go and allow myself to sink into my heart. And mm -hmm. one thing I find there is that we are all made of the same stuff, that there is only something we might call consciousness. You can call it God. You can call it love. But we're all made of the same stuff. We are, in fact, all the same stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we're not separate little souls, as we are often want to believe. And, and that belief, in fact, is the root of all suffering. That's a very Buddhist concept, yeah. that this mm -hmm. idea that we're separate cells that are apparently born, live, and then disappear is mm -hmm. the cause of all suffering. I don't believe that. I believe, I've come to believe through a lot of introspection and kind of sinking into my heart that all there is is consciousness and we're all made of this stuff. We're temporary little permutations of consciousness like eddies in a stream. The stream is consciousness. We're a little ripple in the stream that seems to appear and then disappear, but it's never separate from the stream. Yeah. And so if you embrace a reality such as this, it very much influences the way you think about death. Because death is not the disappearance of a separate self. Mm -hmm. Death is just the eddy in the stream appearing to yield its energy back to the rest of the water. And I think this is a really important principle that we all need to kind of come to our own conclusions about our mortality. Uh, again, it's kind of mm -hmm. sitting with this reality. Excuse me. Um, and... And, and sitting with it and learning to accept it. And if we don't, then the alternative is we're resisting it. We're horrified by this idea and, you know, it, it, it haunts us. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of looked it in the face and said to myself, um, sorry, I get uh, somebody keeps insisting on reaching me, but um, maybe it's my son. Anyway, I took this on and, um, you know, I think we all need to do the work, spend the time and energy mm -hmm. uh, to, to embrace and accept that which causes us discomfort and pain. Yeah. And so that's been a, a long ongoing process for me. So yeah. I felt like I was about as well equipped as one can be to deal with the loss of my son. Mm, thank you. Yeah. And just to kind of back up what you said, like, my mom passed away in November and I sat, spent some time 
in nature and uh, there were a lot of like messages, teachings kind of coming through for me in terms of uh, what is your relationship with decay? Because my mom, you know, she had Alzheimer's stroke, like she really didn't look good when she passed, you know? And it was, I was almost like traumatized by it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I spent some time in nature just seeing my mom like that. I mean, it, it, yeah, it was a lot. Um, and, um, I spent some time in nature and I was like, kind of instructed to pick up this seed we have in Hawaii here, these like kind of like big red oval seeds. And they're like these bright red seeds. And it was like, pick that up, put that in your fanny pack. You know, I was like, okay. Uh -huh. And I got home, I'm like, you know, in just total zombie mode of just overwhelmed, you know, um, and I put the seed, I emptied out my fanny pack, put the seed on my nightstand, you know, going about life. And in a few days, I'm walking past the nightstand and I see that it's all started to like shrivel up and turn black and looks almost kind of like white moldy stuff on it. And I, my knee jerk reaction was, ew, right? Like I saw it all like that and I was like, ew. And then, I, and it was like, boom. And it was like, why is that ew? Why is that ew? And I was like, wow. All right. You know, and I got invited on a big journey of like what my relationship was with decay. And like, if you look at, you know, the forest, if you have any sort of forest or jungle, which you got to have something like that somewhere where you live and you see all the dead leaves and pine needles and seeds and all of these things, they, per it perfectly reflects what you were just saying about like coming back into the hole, you know? And I think our egoic need for significance blinds us from being able to be okay with that sometimes, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But you know, the reason that nature, if you, if you will, what we call nature is so essential to our, our being is that it reminds us that we are not a separate self. Exactly. You know, when I go for a hike in the redwoods, you have these gigantic, mm -hmm. gigantic redwood and sequoia trees here so in Northern cool. California. Awesome. It's just an immediate sense <laughs> of peace and being present. And yeah. when we are present, there is no fear and anxiety. Yeah. Those are in the future. Those are obsession with the future combined with our negativity bias. Mm -hmm. When we're present, we're not ruminating over the past again with our negativity bias. So mm -hmm. the ability to be present is really essential to happiness. And when you are walking in the forest or potentially on the beach or uh, just in a very natural environment, preferably not without a lot of noise and other people around, this sense of there is just this one consciousness nature, God, love, being, awareness. And I'm not just a little separate self. Mm -hmm. I am just a little eddy Part in the stream, just like that yeah. piece of organic material that you picked up. It's just returning to the source. Mm -hmm. It's, yep. you know, it's not, you can think of it as decay, but it's just the rhythm of these little outpouchings of consciousness that appear to come and go, but really they're always in place. They're always connected to everything else. And, and that's our true nature. And so yeah. we resist that because as you said, we're, we're clinging to this egoic mm -hmm. concept uh, of how we're special and we want to be accomplished and, and we're separate. Mm -hmm. You know, we kind of bang our heads against the wall and try to find comfort in being separate, but uh, it's, it's a, exercise in futility mm -hmm. path toward happiness is uh realizing our true nature which is to be uh inexorably part of this greater mm -hmm. world this consciousness mm -hmm. and and we get that in nature we may get that with mm -hmm. listening to an amazing timeless piece of music or looking at a piece of art that really compels us yeah uh, we're reminded that we are not just this little speck of uh, individual stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's a part of the realization of our true nature and mm -hmm. essential to happiness. Yeah. I kind of want to skip for a second over to non-judgment, um, in light of what you just said, because I have found that a huge barrier to being in the present moment is a desire to escape, uh, 
self-judgment. Uh, mm. I, I found that the pattern of self-abuse, um, being hard on oneself, um, never being good enough, like this insane internal pressure is a huge block and a huge problem that is pervasive amongst adults in this current period of time that we find ourselves in. And I think a lot of that has to do with how little psychological awareness there was in our parents' generation. I mean, they just didn't have, we're like going scrolling through Instagram and it's like the top, like, you know, some, one of some of the biggest names in psychology or just like right spoon fed right into our face about, you know, here's what a trauma bond is and here's what codependency is and here's what uh, self-regulation and here's how to regulate yourself. Our parents didn't, that, that didn't exist. You know, they could go to the library and roll the dice and hope they get a good, you know, you know, book on psychology, but they're probably not going to do that. So they didn't have that. Right. So now we have a lot of, um, adults who were raised with shaming, pressuring, uh, conditional love, all as strategies to modify behavior for parents who didn't even realize that was it. They thought they were being really good parents. You know, they thought they were teaching discipline and like helping them to grow up well or grow up right and, you know, be a good person, whatever that parent deemed was good or right or well, you know? And so as a result, now I have found that some of, uh, some of the biggest blocks to mindfulness and being in the present moment is that as soon as someone is left without any sort of outside distractions or the, you know, busyness of, oh, got to check the email. Oh, got to blah, blah, blah. Got to go run the errand. Like without that, now they're sitting in this space where all of that is available on the table and can be very uncomfortable for people to really sit with that, you know? Um, and so I wanted to hit next on non-judgment and how that is important for being able to be in this present moment space well as you as you suggested um non-judgment is very closely linked to acceptance yeah but it is it's also dependent on gratitude so if we're judging yeah. ourselves negatively let's just sort of shift to being grateful for who we are yeah. and all the positive things about us our health our relative wealth and most of us are not in severe poverty, most of us have a roof over right. our heads. Most right. of us have accomplishments. Yeah. But non-judgment is so important because judgment is seeing the world around us, others, and most notably ourselves, through our negativity bias. Yeah. It's seeing things through a, a colored lens, not necessarily as they actually are. Yeah. And that coloration, unfortunately, is often very negative because it's the way our brains are wired. So how do we transcend that? Well, you know, the game meditation practice can be done in three or four minutes. Nice. It starts with slow, deep breathing, nice. which activates our parasympathetic nervous system through the vagus nerve, lowers our heart rate, blood pressure, our blood sugar, lowers the adrenaline and cortisol in our body. So we get up in the morning, we open the blinds, we do our morning hygiene, we find a comfortable place to sit, we close our eyes, we start with slow, deep breathing, and we do this for 30 or 45 seconds, and then we do a self-guided tour, first the G and gain, that for which we're grateful, which we've discussed, uh, something uncomfortable that we learn to accept, our intention, which can be just focusing on what's happening right now with our current mm -hmm. sensations, uh, start with five seconds of that and then expand it and then go to non-judgment. So this is a tool for learning how to drop judgments. So okay. we're sitting, and this is an example. There are many ways to do this, but this is one of my favorites. Sitting with our eyes closed, breathing slowly and deeply into our abdomen, really expanding, having the sense of expansion, slowness, deepness, Picture an image of the earth apparently suspended in space, one of these beautiful NASA images. And the earth, although it is a beautiful planet, really is neither good nor bad. The earth does not possess the qualities of goodness and badness. It just is the planet that it is. It's obvious to us when we see things with this clarity. Mm -hmm. And we link this to our slow, deep breathing, this awareness of the earth being beautiful, but just a planet, neither good nor bad. And then it 
dawns on us that it's only logical for us to think that I too am just a human being. I am neither good nor bad. I'm just the person that I am. I'm just the human that I am. Mm -hmm. And we link this to our slow, deep breathing. And we link this I amness. I am neither good nor bad. I simply am mm -hmm. that I am. I simply the person that I am and linking this to the breath. And we sit with that for several cycles of the slow, deep, intentional breathing. And then we transition just to focus on the breath before we slowly open our eyes. But this is a tool, it's a practice for learning how simply to drop the judgments. Mm -hmm. And this is a way of looking at the world, looking at the others, uh, looking at others in our life, and most notably ourselves. We don't have to judge things as good or bad. We want to discern, I have an hour for lunch. Do I want to spend this with Tara, who's upbeat and fun and engaged? Or with another friend of mine who's rather down and kind of complaining and, and doesn't appear to be a very grateful person, but I love him like a brother. Mm -hmm. I want to discern which of these two people do I want to spend this hour with? And most of the time, it's going to be Tara, mm -hmm. my upbeat, engaged, pragmatic, forward-looking, positive, optimistic friend. Um, but that doesn't mean that the other friend is bad. Right. I don't have to confer right. this quality of goodness or badness to right. either person. Yes. They just are the person that they are, as I am. Mm -hmm. And I may discern that I'd rather spend that hour with Tara. But again, it doesn't make the other friend bad. It doesn't mm -hmm. make Tara good. So this is just an exercise in realizing our true nature, kind of sinking into this awareness that we don't have to judge as good or bad. Um, mm -hmm. All people are inherently, uh, I would say, I look at the world with benevolent indifference. So there's a little bit of benevolence involved, not so far as to create a judgment, but indifference meaning I'm open to all things without bias, prejudice, or judgment. Mm -hmm. And we can rewire our brains to interact with the world around us and ourselves in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's huge. really, these practices are all about rewiring our brains toward a state of happiness and peace and letting go of this negativity, this judgment, this distraction with uh, the, creating the inability to be present, which is how our brains are wired through evolution for our survival. But we now have the luxury to rewire our brains toward happiness. Mm -hmm. We're not so worried about surviving anymore. We're, most of us are in a place where we don't really have to worry about survival. So mm -hmm. if this is something we have the intention to do, you know, the pathways are, are very available to us. Mm -hmm. uh, you have your practice and the way you teach. Mm -hmm. Likewise, for me, there are many, many ways to approach yeah. these simple truths. I think the mm -hmm. simple truths are physical well-being, which is very intertwined with our spiritual well-being, sleep, exercise, nutrition, supplements, drugs being maybe under that umbrella for, for health and longevity. And on the mental and spiritual side, gratitude, acceptance, intention, and non-judgment. So I think it's really helpful to kind of whittle things down to their essence and, mm -hmm. and try to make things as simple as possible. But, uh, you know, the good news yeah. is that all of these things are readily accessible. Yeah, yeah. I um, I, I refer to non-judgment and my coaching as good bad thinking. Okay, and it's a huge thing. You know, it's it's just getting into this place where let's use food as an example. You know, like instead of thinking, oh, the cheesecake is bad and the protein shake is good, or vice versa. <laughs> it depends on the person. Um, <laughs> instead thinking, uh, what, what do I choose? What do I want? What are the results? You know, what is, what will I experience as a result of that coming into a much more neutral place? Like the cheesecake tastes good. It's one of my favorite desserts. I'm definitely not living a life without cheesecake in it ever. Um, but right now let's see, I don't know. I just, I think I, I don't want it to take down my brain performance. I've noticed I get a little foggy when I do that. So like, 
okay, I'll say that for later. Maybe, you know, when I really, it feels like the right time and I'm going to go with the protein shake for now. Like it's much more neutral. Nothing. One's you're not a good girl because you had the or good boy because you had the protein shake or a bad person, you know, but that's, it gets intertwined like that. And so I have definitely noticed that to be a huge part in like a health journey. You're not like a good person or something because you went and worked out today. It's just purely like within yourself, like choosing, how do I want to manage things today? How, how do I want to feel? How do I want to play mm -hmm. this? And being good with that choice that you made. Like if it's like, that's definitely not a good day to work out today. I got crazy sleep and I feeling kind of inflamed and like, definitely not, you know, it's just being good with the decisions that you're making. And the last little thing I'll add to that is like, when it comes to other people and judgment, just sharing, I, I went through a huge process with uh, just straight from my guides. Like it was like, your only work right now is unconditionally love everyone. Right. So I went through a huge practice with unconditional love, had it like on my, you know, my screensaver on the thing on my fridge, just really big love everyone unconditionally. Right. So I was just reminding myself and I found it to be the ultimate hack for getting into the state of non-judgment. You know, like as soon as I was like, oh, that jerk, I can't believe he, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> not saying I didn't have those moments, <laughs> but when I caught myself and I'm like, love, love, love him unconditionally whoa, all of a sudden it was like, uh, so easy to have boundaries, nothing but love. Good luck on your journey. I've got all sorts of stuff I'm working through too. Just this really neutral energy. So I found that, that to be a good cue, like a coaching cue for myself in terms of getting to that state is like, unconditionally love them. Whoa, I can, it's wounded, blah, blah, blah. And I don't have to play if I don't want to. I also don't have to be mad at them. Yay. <laughs> so just throwing that out there. And then um, the last thing I, I just wanted to hit on intention a little more because we we skipped that one. So can you share a little bit more on that part? of? Well, I think we've been discussing it, Tara. Um, the fact is our brains are wired in certain ways, which seem to interfere with our ability to be happy and at peace. And so if we want to be happy and at peace, we have to have a plan. Because if we just relax into our default mode, we have all these default mode circuits in our brain True. that are firing all the time. And if we pay no attention, we we default to those circuitry, that circuitry, those circuits. Right. Right. And so if we want to evolve to become happier, more grateful, accepting, non-judgmental, love unconditionally, we have to have a plan right? We have to have purposefulness. We have to have intention. Right. That's why John kabat defines mindfulness as awareness of the present moment on purpose, non-judgmentally, because we have to do it on purpose. And the good news is when we decide to do something and we have a plan, we have an intention, there are people like you out there to help. There are a myriad of resources we have access to yeah. but we have to have a plan and if we do uh you know there's a lot of help out there both yeah. in the outside world and internally and so but it starts with having a plan having intention yeah for sure awesome thank you so much um we will link up your website which is greghammermd.com and your instagram which is greg greg hammer md um, and obviously, uh, your book, and again, the title of it is gain without pain, the happiness handbook for healthcare professionals, but also I'd say for everyone. <laughs> so, um, yeah, any last words that you'd like to share? Well, I always like to remind anybody who's listening that, uh, anybody who is a bit obsessed with the past and negativity and feeling depressed, feeling sad, feeling isolated, that we're all this way. This is the way our brains are wired. We all have a negativity bias. We all have trouble enjoying and fully experiencing the present moment. So you are not alone. This is not your dirty little secret. Feel free to discuss it with your friends. Um, be out with it. Uh, it'll help you let go of it. Yeah. And you know, we're all in the same boat. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Tara.